talk about his mishaps, mistakes, embarrassing moments, or ex girlfriends. So thanks for listening, everyone. That's all. <laughs> Uh, seriously, listen closely, and this will seem like the shortest three hours of your life. Um, so let me tell you a bit about Dad. Dad was born in, as you know, 1918, 100 years ago. And that was eight months before the end of the First World War. But just to make that a bit more visceral, he was evacuated from London to avoid the Zeppelin raids as a baker. And he was moved to Tunbridge Wells, which was actually close to Germany, but... <laughs> um, then he went to uh, Repton's uh, Prep School. Oh, I got that right. Yeah, Rimpton, Sorry, Rimpton's Prep School in Thanet. Um And it's no longer a prep school. The less kind of you might not find it entirely inappropriate to know that it's now a home for juvenile delinquents. <laughs> um, Dad then went off to Eton, uh, where he got a taste for Rome which uh, you, all, uh, you can see in the pictures around here. And then he went to Trinity Hall at Cambridge, and he won the, he was the stroke, the crew that won the 1939 boat race and the 1940 boat race, which is the only wartime boat race. And that portrait of him was painted in about 1938, 1939, uh, when he was, he was originally in the Territorial Army, war broke out, they put him in the army, made him a captain. After he won the only wartime boat race in 1940, thankfully, they took away his pips, his uh, captaincy, and sent him off to Tanganyika, which is now Tanzania, to be a district commissioner running part of Tanganyika. And he was told basically to keep a lid on it, because we, we need just keep everything quiet until we finish with the Germans, because we can't fight the war on two fronts. If he hadn't been sent to Tanganyika, his regiment, the 8th Rifles, would have been in the rear guard of Dunkirk. Wow. Rifles versus panzer tanks. Give me goosebumps. They were decimated. Nine out of ten were killed. The Germans were shock troops. They didn't have time to take prisoners. So if he remained in his regiment, probably wouldn't be here today and we wouldn't all be celebrating. And luckily, he went off to Africa, um, organized things in Tanganyika. Then in 1943... He was seconded to the King's African Rifles, and as he would put it, chased the Italians out of Ethiopia and Abyssinia. And he said it was actually quite terrifying because the Italians would, of course, always run away. But about once a week, they would stay and defend the little village. By the way, that is Lara Burley. That's his great great niece, and oh. only a 99 year age difference. <laughs> 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 oh. So he's uh, off, he, he chases the Italians out of uh, Tanganyika, uh, sorry, out of uh, Abyssinia and Ethiopia. Um, he said it, was, it wasn't a particularly, I mean, war is horrible, but it wasn't a particularly nasty war. It was like rifles and things. It wasn't uh, anything like the Russian front or, or the European front. Um, then he went back to Tanganyika, or modern-day Tanzania. Um, he helped put down the Mau Mau uprising. Um, there was a terrible famine there. Um, he fixed that, and he got the food crops growing, the, uh, the ground nut, the peanut scheme, and turned a situation where people were starving into trade surfaces, and they were exporting food. Just going back a bit, in 1938, he met the love of his life, it was not my mother or his first wife, it was uh, Mary Rose Lemaitre, beautiful French lady. Her picture's somewhere here, she's no longer with us. They met, they were in love, and he said, look, I'm going off to Tanganyika, why don't you come with me? She said, look, I'm, I'm too young, I'm 19, I, I can't leave France. So he went off to Tanganyika, later got married to Cynthia, had a couple of children, Desmond is no longer with us. Catherine, who can't be here today, who is with us, but not with us today, just to be clear. Um, he had his second marriage to me. Uh, sorry. <laughs> 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 Family secret. <laughs> Please say it soon as men, did you? Um, to my mother, my dearly darling mother, uh, Rosamond, 
um, had me, and then uh, that didn't go so well, apart from having me. <laughs> and then in 1966, he met up again with Mary Rose Lemaitre. They met at the cousin's wedding. Because remember, in those days, there was no internet. You couldn't get in touch with people. There was no friends reunited. Um, they met again, still very much in love. Um, and then he was, as he would say, sticking wait, waiting for her husband um, to die, basically. Um, her husband had been in the French resistance, horribly injured, and uh, he died, I think, in the 1980s. And then Dad and Mary Rose got together, had about 20 or 30 great years together. And honestly, I've never seen them happier. They were always really, really happy together, laughing, giggling, joking. Um, he was at his finest when he was with her. Um, then he was sort of a captain of industry. He did tremendous things. He worked for a lot of English corporations like uh, General Electric, uh, the Best is Meat Company. He was really instrumental in transforming Turkey's agriculture. From the, Turkey's agriculture was pretty medieval, and he completely modernized it, working with the International Monetary Fund and other sort of villains of the day. Um, and I think that's the, some other people are going to say a few words, very short. Um, about, which will fill you in about other parts of his history. But really, I'd have to say the obvious. I mean, we're gathered here today to share a really remarkable, remarkable achievement that is given to very few of us. Very, very few of us are going to make 100. Um, and I'd say, let's have a show of hands. I mean, who here wants to live as long as Bevis? Yes. Hooray! 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 Bravo! So, thank you very, very much. And I know he feels a bit old. Um, I, mean, I was on the internet the other day and I was watching the form video. And you know when you have to fill your date of birth and you're sort of scrolling down. And I was scrolling down and down trying to get to 90. It turned into Roman numerals. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's going to stand up. He's going to so say I'm now going to hand you over to my older brother, uh, David Burley, who's going to say a few words. Um, and then Bill Masser is going to say a few words um, about his um, rowing days. Hubert Picarda, uh, no relation to Captain Picard, is going to say a few words about his sort of clubbing days and things. And then I would invite any of you that want to stand up and say a few words, and I do mean a few words, less than a minute. Um, about what Bevis has meant to you. So, if any of you want to say a few words, you'll have an opportunity in a minute. Not yet. <laughs> so, thank you very much. And I'd ask you to raise your glasses. And let's have a toast to Bevis and may he, long may he live. Bevis. Happy birthday. Now I hand you over to my old brother, David Burley. <laughs> nice. Hey, well done. Done, Frank. Well, I'll be very... Okay, okay, you'll talk. No, I... <laughs> yeah, um, I shall be very brief. Um, and uh, I'm lucky... My name's David Burley, and I'm lucky enough to be Bevis' uh, stepson. And I'd just like to thank you, Bevis, from all our family, for all that you've done for us over the years of being the grandfather to our boys that they never had. Wonderful job, and we're so grateful for you, for all you've done. And we've had one test, but I think also, I mean, Frank has done such a great job with yeah. the event together. Yeah, yeah. And also looking after the flat, etc. I think we should have a test to you, Frank. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. To Frank! And a quick toast to Jane Fox, who's been yes. very helpful and instrumental in organising this party and the last one. Thank you, Jane. Good old Jane. Oy. Do we have Bill Massa here? Or Hubert Picard? Hubert, come on up. I'll be brief. Yeah. Be brief. Just be brief. Thank you. On just a remarkable cause that Bevis was. I had a great pleasure of playing that. When I joined France Club, Bevis has already been a member for 12 years. And he'd also been a member of the Turf Club, which I joined in 1986. So uh, I belonged to two clubs where I had the pleasure of meeting Bevis. Yeah. We never met by arrangement. 
Uh, we met for Church's Day, which is the best way, and we usually were sitting on top tables in Pratt's Club, which is owned by the Duke of Devonshire, the Duke of Devonshire, Andrew Devonshire, as he was in those days. And we have here the two, uh, Georgina, the stewardess, and George, the, the, uh, her, her husband, who are very loyally here, and known both as, uh, not quite as long as I have, as we're very familiar with him, and delighted to see him. He, I don't need to say it, but he is a very, very genial and affable conversationist. And Pratt's is a, a conversation club. That's the purpose of it. And he was prized there as a conversationist. I don't need to say anything about his loyalty to Trinity Hall and, uh, and both clubs in which he has immersed himself, and also Henley, where he was uh, always uh, around. But he is the longest living member of Pat's Club. Which is, which is hey. uh, they all bear witness to the fact that the secret of life is not to stop working, as Stephen Hawking has reminded us. It's one of the two essential commandments given to the children of Stephen Hawking by their father, the other being to look at the stars and not at your feet. <laughs> I've known well and corresponded with and entertained the following long-lived known and generic Pratt's members. Winston Graham lived to be 95, whom I put up for Pratt's. He was responsible for Poldark, Marnie and the birds. Sir Patrick Lee Firmer, Paddy Lee Firmer, 96, who smoked a hundred cigarettes a day. <laughs> hey, good on him! Secretary of the Order of Merit, right up until the date of his death. 96, same as Paddy Lee Farmer. And Lord Renton QC, parliamentarian, 98, until his death. Bevis has ploughed his own furrow, not as a writer, not as a, a parliamentarian, but a very, very interesting life, of which I haven't heard the half of it, even today. Uh, and he is a charming, interesting fellow, mixing with every generation, and that's the other thing. He is keeping up with all the boat clubs, he has many friends among the young who admire him, and he shows interest in whoever he is conversing with. That's how he's remained young at heart, and he's no, in, no less impressive. Uh, for, for that, to my way of thinking. He's a wonderful chap, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's lovely. Come on up. Come on down. Price is fine. And after Bill's had his uh, a few words, come on, Bill. Well, After Bill's had a few words, I'll open the floor. Anyone that wants to say a few words about Dash, what he meant to you, come on up to the stage and say a few brief words. Do you want to come up? Yeah, I can. Yeah, absolutely. Well done. The end of the song. Sweet. Yeah. I'm not Some of you way. may know. <laughs> Trinity Hall Boat Club, uh, account written by Timothy Swan, there were several, there was an early one by Bond, has an appreciation of Bevis. If you have read it or know of it in the past, it's worth hearing again. It's only half a page. <laughs> Bevis quickly settled down on coming to the college in, in 1936 <laughs> to enhance the reputation as an oarsman he had gained at Eton. He was very nearly a natural oarsman a very fine scholar of good but not outstanding physique in whom the principles and purposes of orthodox rowing had become ingrained. He won the bush fox skulls with ease in his first year, the cahoons, that's the university skulls, in his second when he was spearman at Putney, <coughs> handsomely earned his blue in 1939, there's a picture over there of it, and rowed again as president in 1940. He was particularly in his element at Henley, twice winning the Visitors' Cup and one year also taking the Goblets with Hugh Parker. While at Cambridge, as his experience grew, he won nearly every small boat event for which he could enter and accumulated more oars than any other hall man for 40 years since Adam oh. Bell. In short, there was little on the river that he could not do except to achieve possibly his great ambition 
to take the whole head in 1940. Hitler stopped this. Probably the only man who could. <laughs> <laughs> Bevis's presence in the boats with our American stars at the time was a happy thing. Without him, the length and rhythm the big men needed could hardly have been found. With him, the crew, right up to the bows, could really exercise their power. He gave his boats vitality in their training, confidence always, and much of his own outstanding racing ability. Of Bevis, it was always said that he was quite incapable of not racing. <laughs> Bevis, engaging, diffident, and friendly, a purist among all of the time, but ready to look for something good in any style, did a good deal of coaching while he was still up. His boats liked him and went well for him, and he acquired much coaching experience that has served the THBC uncommonly well ever since. The colonial service has taken him abroad, where it is apparent that his pleasant qualities, sincerity, and that natural ability, which he owns but was at pains at times to conceal in his work, are being adapted to the service of his district. Fortunately, his leaves are neither too infrequent nor too short to prevent his coaching seriously, and he is as generous with his time now as he was of his spirit when he raced. He is a very good coach, of great knowledge and experience, who applies the true principles uncompromisingly without boring his crews. Last paragraph. <laughs> Many oarsmen have gained much from the Trinity Hall Boat Club, and Bevis more than most. Many have repaid it, but few more than he by his great abiding and practically expressed concern for his club, its members, its style and its standard. Well, 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 well. Bravo! <laughs> Next up, we have Julian Fellows. We're very lucky to have the chairman of the Hurlingham Cup. He's going to say, "Oh, how lovely!" Oh, I'm cry. It's unbelievable. Oh, dear. <laughs> what a wonderful uh, achievement. Um, and I think perhaps a lot of you don't perhaps know uh, how much of a connection the Sanford family had with this club. Um, your father was first elected to the club, uh, I think, in 1926. And uh, you wrote in the Hurlingham magazine recently about being brought to the club when you were nine uh, and seeing uh, the, uh, the devastation wrought by the great flood of that particular year. Um, you're not, I think, the oldest member of this club. But you are certainly the oldest standing member in terms of membership. Uh, hey. You were elected in 1933 Blimey, as an associate right. member, and you pay the princely price of three pounds three shillings for your annual membership. <laughs> Would that it was like this nowadays. <laughs> Uh, and then other members of your family uh, joined thereafter. Various also served on our plans committee and the main committee. And one particular uh, statistic uh, is worthwhile mentioning. Uh, the first chairman of the club, Earl Ancaster, uh, was uh, chairman in 1903. Uh, and since then, uh, there have been in total 22 chairmen. And Bevis's life spans 21 of those 22 chairmanships. Good that is God. Quite a, a a man, unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, on behalf of the whole club, I wish you a very happy birthday, many happy returns, and we look forward to celebrating your 125th. <laughs> 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 Lovely, well said. <laughs> Here we have another a word from one of Bevis's contemporaries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello everyone, um, I'm Matthew Guthridge. Um, I'm here with Angus Fogarty, um, representing the Trinity Hall Boat Club. 
Um, I think I, it's worth pointing out that Bevis is the oldest living rowing blue and the only oh, survivor of the three war boat races. Oh, I think that's really quite incredible. I think it's <laughs> oh, Yay! Just judging by the number of tartan and black and white ties that are here, um, it's really very obvious how much Bevis means to the boat club and the boat club means to Bevis. So, happy birthday, Bevis Sanford. Happy oh. birthday. <laughs> Where is my French little brother? Which he had in the dining room. And he said that, oh, I went down the motorway the other day in my uh, uh, car. And um, I was stopped by a policeman, um, and he drew me to one side, and he said, I've been speeding, sir. And he said, I? Well, what speed was I doing? He said, 90 miles an hour. And Bevis said, oh, that's exactly my age. <laughs> <laughs> One of the little stories my husband told me one night, he had two younger members sitting next to him, and, and they said that he, you know, he looked terribly well. I'm not sure whether he was, I think we last saw him when he was 94. And, and they said, yes, he said, um, you know, I'm, no, it's 92. And they said, well, I'm still swimming. So he used to go swimming uh, until he was 92. But it's been a pleasure for us to know him and, and uh, getting a taxi home for him. Um, you know, every night uh, when you came in. And that's all I want to say, and a very happy birthday. Oh, oh lovely. Roll up, roll up. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. Hello. One of Dan's oldest friends. Hello. Um, I just like to say that although we've, we've heard a great deal about Bevis's exploits on the various rivers, um, as he grew older, as he came to Hurling, he has done an extraordinary amount for croquet, croquet at Hurling. Uh, and I would just like to um, thank him very much. Personally, he was responsible for my starting to play croquet, so I'm, so I'm however good or bad, bad I am is entirely due to him. Um, and as always, happy birthday, Bevis. Uh, hey. <laughs> Who's next? Come on, little lady, take you a minute. Oh. John Minter. Chris, yeah, Chris Minter. Chris Minter. <laughs> <laughs> Tell several stories. You names, eh? But for many years, Davis used to follow the boat race in the umpire's launch. Until one day, 
it was pointed out to him that there was something like um, 20 blues who were waiting to sail in the umpire's launch and watch the boat race. And he reluctantly decided he would watch it on TV. He said, you know, you get a much better view that way. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, reference has been made to the performance of the Italians in the war. The Italians who fought in East Africa were infinitely better than the Italians who fought in North Africa. The late Wilfred Thesiger, an Etonian, told me so, because he fought them both in the deserts of North Africa and in East Africa. Thank you. I don't want to have to start naming names, but I would if I have to. Come on up. Hey! Oh, I know that jacket. Yay! I probably don't need to stand up. <laughs> um, I'm here into two, um, uh, two modes, really. One, I'm a fellow Cambridge Blue uh, with, uh, with Bevis. Uh, and he has been involved in the boat of all my time there. He was a great attender at events, as you say, following the boat race. Uh, I'm also a teacher at Eton, so obviously I've seen him uh, visiting his alma mater. One thing that's quite amazing is people used to say that rowing in a boat race takes years off your life. It sort of somehow harms you, and your life expectancy is, uh, is shortened as a result. Now, Bellis did two, so if it somehow shortened his life, he obviously uh, it made a pretty stern start if he could do two boat races to five to 100. So I certainly hope I'll be managing 100 as well. So, well done, Bellis. Oh, Do I have to start naming names, or are you going to come up voluntarily? <laughs> Last chance. Any more for any more? Any more for any more. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Hey. Oh, lovely. Ready? Almost there. Quick, quick, quick. Birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Bevis, happy birthday to you. Hello. 